Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual. This is Concepts Lecture 21 on Surveillance and Privacy. As you can see, there are a lot of variations of surveillance, surveillance and surveillance, self-surveillance, parvalence, and equivalence, and then there are artworks and parodies and takeoffs of surveillance. And most of the theorizing starts with Foucault. So just to return for a second to the Panopticon from Lecture 19, this was in the 18th century prison that was never built, made famous for the 20th century by Foucault. The idea was that a guard would sit at a central place and look all around and see all the prisoners in all their cells. Um, the notion was that if the prisoners knew they were being observed, they would behave, that, so there wouldn't, be, uh, there wouldn't be much policing necessary. Um, from this, Foucault develops whole theories of surveillance that go in different directions. But the key notion of this was that if, the, if a central power could observe, can observe, then the subjects of that power will behave. It turns out that's not true. And there's a really nice um, case study in progress going on, and that is the UK. The UK has more CCTV cameras than any nation. I think, it, I think the number is one surveillance camera to every 14 people in the country. But that doesn't prevent incidents. In fact, sometimes it's the opposite. I tried to get a picture of the police CCTV center in Nottingham. I couldn't quite find it, but this is something similar. But uh, in Nottingham, I had the experience. I was shown you know, what it's like on the streets. Every single street is under surveillance by CCTV. But uh, if it's a nice night out, everybody goes out and parties and makes trouble. And when I was walking down one of those streets, this a guy came up in front of me and punched his girlfriend and she fell down onto the pavement. And, and there was a lot of yelling and screaming. Um, and the person who was with me said, you see, the, the sort of like the game is they know exactly how long the police get to get, take to get here and they know exactly where to go to blend into the crowd so they can't be caught. So it becomes a kind of a sport. So it's the exact opposite of what Foucault thought. Actually, surveillance can make people behave much worse. After the Panopticon, there were a lot of different kinds of uh, surveillance um, as Foucault uh, documents. And there have been a number of attempts to characterize surveillance practices in the period after the Panopticon. The film historian Mark Poster suggested that recent surveillance institutions should better be described as super panopticons because they have uh, very complicated modes of surveillance. And that includes, uh, this kind of complexity also includes ordinary institutions like the School of the Art Institute, where there are all kinds of levels of uh, awareness and information gathering on the part of uh, people in administration, staff, and so on. That kind of surveillance has become, has become typical. It's useful to distinguish three general directions of surveillance, depending on who's watching whom. So surveillance proper, the ordinary surveillance, means looking from above. It's the practice of observation of people by organizations or by centers of power. Surveillance means looking from below. That's a less common term. And it denotes what the visual theorist Nick Mirzoff calls counter-visuality. That is looking back at uh, the centers of power. Those two terms should logically be completed by a third, equivalence, which was coined by the inventor Steve Mann. Equivalence would be the observation of one person by another without differences of power. So I'm going to come back to equivalence later. Surveillance has been used as a technique of resistance, counter-visuality. Steve Mann, the inventor of that term, tells this story about going into a McDonald's in Paris um, and uh, having some guards get angry at him and uh, tear up his belongings um, because he came in wearing an internet-enabled pair of glasses. And uh, in the text, when he told that story, I was kind of imagining the first version of Google Glass um, which was the first internet-enabled um, uh, pair of commercially available glasses that they then withdrew from the market, uh, but actually wore a completely different kind of device, and I can imagine why the guards might have gotten alarmed. On the next slide, I just have a still from his, uh, his own surveillance video. So surveillance isn't the opposite of surveillance, but it's something different. They don't balance each other out, um, and as Mann says, Favoring one doesn't mean you disapprove of the other. 
So that's a, a screen grab from, that, from um, Steve Mann's wearable internet-enabled um, surveillance device that he had on his head when he walked into the McDonald's. In the book Simulation of Surveillance, William Bogart suggests the purpose of surveillance in capitalism is the prediction of future movements. Um, and that's just an Amazon warehouse to um, suggest that Amazon in particular, large companies like that, uh, need future surveillance in order to predict the flow of goods that under different, uh, under changing demand. At the moment, the closest things to future surveillance are personalized advertising, the internet, and other tracking devices. The CAPTCHA has also evolved into future surveillance. In 2014, Google announced a second generation CAPTCHA in which you just uh, check a box saying, I'm not a robot. It replaced the uh, first generation CAPTCHA in which you had to solve all sorts of different puzzles and do other things. That second generation CAPTCHA works on a proprietary algorithm that presumably looks at patterns of mouse movements. Then in 2017, Google announced a third generation CAPTCHA which can work in the background monitoring computer use and looking for patterns of use. So it's invisibly predicting the fact that you're not a robot into the future, which is a pretty great accomplishment. Some more variations on surveillance. Self-surveillance could include social media posting, of course. In terms of surveillance apparatus, it includes art projects like the house in Apeldoorn in the Netherlands, which has posted its statistics all the way back to 1998. Uh, on that uh, that on that screenshot, toilet flushes in the last 28 days, most recent toilet flushes, and toilet flushes per year. Uh, and that's just that's just one of the statistics that they uh, that they broadcast from their house. It's so in this way, in this sense, the house, which is quintessentially a private space, is made entirely public, but the occupants are retaining their own privacy, even though they're surveilling themselves. Parvalence or equivalence are two terms used to describe surveillance among equals. There aren't any examples that I know of of surveillance among exact equals. Uh, an example in the United States of parvalence uh, is the database of convicted sex offenders, which is made public and it's available on third party, party websites. Um, this is an example uh, from Chicago. Um, I've anonymized the person's face, the statistics, and even the map uh, because, of course, this lecture may outlive the laws that make this information public. In addition to public laws regulating and restricting parvalence, there are also self-imposed restrictions. 2207 Seymour Avenue in Cleveland was the address of a house where three women were imprisoned for nearly a decade. The house itself was raised several months after the women were freed, but Google Street View decided to blur the view until it could be updated. As of 2020, when I checked, uh, they have not retaken the Street View, but they have re-blurred the house, even though the house doesn't exist anymore. So there wasn't a legal reason for the, them to do this. This was a self-imposed restriction. I think it was probably just to, you know, eliminate uh, voyeurism and and uh, and. Uh, um, eliminate people from wanting to see this house where all those horrible things happened. So notice that Steve Mann's category, equivalence, the observation of one person by another without differences of power, doesn't apply in any of these cases, and there may in fact be no examples of it given the nature of power relations. And that's a photo of, of Mann with um, SWIM, his device that makes electromagnetic waves visible. And if you'd like to see some really, really funny, geeky uh, videos, and check out the videos that he made of this device. Then there are parodic and art world um, instances of surveillance. i just give a couple examples of those. A very knowing, if not a parodic, surveillance site is this one. It's the Dealey Plaza webcam, which offers, quote, the view the assassin of President John F. Kennedy would have had on November 22, 1963, as he fired shots onto the motorcade on Elm Street. So that's the street on the right there. You see those cars going off. That's where uh, Kennedy was shot, and this is the place he was shot from. 
it's not parodic, but it's very, it's very knowing, this kind of site. And a second example, just among absolutely millions that I could have chosen. This is the Queensland pitch drop experiment. This is my favorite uh, thing to watch uh, when I, I want to watch something that's incredibly boring. It's live 24 seven. Uh, this thing is in a museum in Australia. And that's pitch, which is something get from uh, pine trees. And in 1927, it was put into this funnel. Uh, the idea was to demonstrate that pitch, which seems like a rock hard substance, actually is a liquid, but flows very slowly. And since 1927, only nine drops have fallen. And if you want to watch and see when this drop will fall, you have, might wait up to 14 years for the next drop to fall. In fact, no one has ever been there watching when any of them have fallen. You can see in the uh, beaker on the right, the drops that have fallen. When I recorded this, the video feed was hung up, but <laughs> it doesn't matter because the thing doesn't move. Some conclusions. Foucault is still the principal theorist of surveillance, even though his principal observation about the model, the paradigm for all surveillance, the Panopticon uh, prison design doesn't actually work. Uh, in, in, in practice. But the kinds of surveillance have multiplied, surveillance, parvalence, super panopticons, and so have the effects, inequality, violence, voyeurism, and so on. Privacy and surveillance aren't opposites. There can be surveillance with privacy uh, and vice versa. The, the subject is much more complicated uh, than it was when Foucault wrote. So this is something which is available as a field for art, for artworks and for art interventions, but it's also something that's actively of interest um, in politics and in, um, and in institutions of power. So it's a very good example of an interface between the art world um, and the uh, political and social world um, that's open for exploration.